All right. Okay. Okay. Would you say a helicopter is a gyrocraft, rotorcraft, a category of rotary wing airplanes, a subgroup of gyrocopters? A type of rotorcraft. That'd be correct. Um, would you say helicopter turbine engines produce less, the same, or more thrust than piston engines? Uh, turbine engines produce more thrust than piston. Okay. Um, what are the four main forces acting on helicopter in flight? Lift, weight, thrust, and drag. Okay. Okay, that's a stupid question. <laughs> I'm looking at it. Yeah. All right, I'm not even going to read that off. All right. All right. All right. On many helicopters, where is the horizontal stabilizer located? A uh, horiz uh, horizontal stabilizer bar is located on the tail boom. Good job. What is the purpose of the tail rotor? Uh, purpose of the tail rotor is to counteract the torque of the main rotor. Good job. What are a few types of landing gear? That, uh, uh, wheels, skids, um, the little, sure. the little water things. I think you call them pontoons. Yeah, that's what I was about. Yeah, I wasn't sure the exact word on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are the controls? Uh, what are the controls that a pilot uses to maneuver? The helicopter. Uh, collective, cyclic, and anti-torque pedals. Good job. Where is all the weight centrally concentrated in the helicopter? There's a there's a name for it. Uh, the center of gravity. Good job. When a pilot banks in a turn in a helicopter, mm -hmm. does the weight increase or decrease? Weight increases. How is lift created in a helicopter? Uh, lift is created via the main rotor. Okay. Define Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle states that as the internal velocity of a fluid increases, its pressure decreases. Okay. As the velocity of a fluid increases, its internal pressure decreases. Yes, sorry. No, I'm sorry. Would you say thrust acts parallel or perpendicular to drag? Thrust acts thrust acts I'm just drawing it out. Thrust acts perpendicular to drag. No, it'd be parallel. Okay. <laughs> Would say, okay. Does lift act parallel or perpendicular to thrust? So lift and thrust. Uh, so that's perpendicular then? Very good. Okay. Are there subcomponents to drag? Yes, there are. What are these subcomponents? 
Uh, subcomponents are parasite drag, profile drag, or uh, parasite and induced. The vortices. The vortices that are created by the main rotor. What kind of drag do they produce? It broke up a little bit there. I didn't hear the end of that. The vortices mm. that are created by the main rotor. What kind of drag do they, they produce? Induced. Mm. The potential energy the potential energy of a helicopter is controlled by what? Would you say it's controlled by the forward movement, the altitude? Um, uh, potential energy would be controlled by the collective? Well, that's not an option. For, okay, uh, for, okay, thrust, uh, for thrust or altitude? Altitude. Altitude. Mm -hmm. Could you state Newton's, could you state Sir Isaac Newton's third law of motion for me? Yes. Isaac Newton's third law of motion is for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction or reactionary force. <coughs> so yeah, it, it could come two ways. For every force is an equal opposite force, or for every action there's an equal opposite reaction. Mm -hmm. As long as you have balance, you're okay. Yeah. True or false? Do multi-engine helicopters have a throttle for each engine? True. In a helicopter, if you wanted your... Where's my little helicopter? I had a little helicopter rel replica on my desk. I moved it when I had pizza. <laughs> All right. So let's just pretend that this is your helicopter. Okay. All right. And you want to you want to move your nose left or right. Which mm. axis which axis is this aircraft rotating about? And what is the name of the motion? So the name of the motion is yaw, and it is acting on the vertical axis. And what controls make this happen? Uh, the anti-torque pedals. Very good. Can you tell me what causes dissymmetry of lift? Dissymmetry of lift is caused by <coughs> forces on the advancing and retreating blades of the main rotor. One more time. Uh, symmetry of lift is caused by unequal force, unequal forces on the advancing and retreating blades of the main rotor. So I'll probably go with the speeds. Okay. Because the speeds are what make this happen. Mm -hmm. Like on the advancing side, that main rotor blade could be moving at 600 knots. Mm -hmm. And the retreating could be, uh, I don't know. Somewhere around 350. I forget what the rotary wing handbook says, but the advancing blade is definitely moving faster than the uh, retreating when in motion. So just uneven speed rather than unequal force. Well, if you got speed, you have force, but yeah, I'd like okay. to, we'd like to focus on the speed when we when we teach or talk about the symmetry of lift. Okay. That's one of the uh, key points. Gotcha.
in areas where there's too much lift, mm -hmm. what are the main rotor blades going to tend to do? Would they lead, lag, or flap? Uh, flap. Okay, good job. Um, can you tell me about coning and what causes coning? Coning is caused by lift and centrifugal force. Good job. Big word. <laughs> I love the best we do. <laughs> All right. Um, can you tell me about gyroscopic precession? So gyroscopic precession, I know it's It has to do with the movement of the main rotor blade, and it's felt 90 degrees after, like, an unequal force. I'm not wording it right. Um, it, uh, I'm not entirely sure. Okay, I want you to Google that right now. Okay. Travis Scott, perception, and then after you're reading it, I want you to explain it to me, please. Get that muscle memory going, and yeah, you won't, uh, I guess, uh, blank on that question again in the future. It's gyroscopic precession. And then I'm going to send you a image. Now, tell draggers. And you just have to apply this to your helicopter. Tail draggers typically have a nose up attitude when they're ground because the tail is lower, right? So, what happens is the propeller is spinning, right? And as the plane speeds up, the nose comes down and the tail comes off the ground. So, the force is exerted at the top, right? But that's not where the resultant force comes out. The resultant force comes out 90 degrees and exerts itself forward. And so that's what you've got to kind of visualize with, the, with your main rotor. With your main rotor, you typically tilt your nose downward, right? To get going. And so as a result, 90 degrees in the direction of rotation, you're going to get that result in effect. And you should see that in the uh, image I just showed you, or, or uh, put on our timeline. Gotcha. Okay. So that's a very, very, that's something you want to know. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can you name five components? I'm not saying that there's just five. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me five major components of a rotary wing aircraft? Yes. Uh, airframe, fuselage, landing gear, main rotor, tail rotor, and then there is also the power plant and transmission. 
Okay. Can you tell me about translating tendency? Translating tendency is when a helicopter is in hover uh, due to the tail girder helicopter begins to move laterally to the right. So what causes that? Uh, I believe it's the tail rotor thrust, correct? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about the three types of main rotor systems? Yes. Uh, there's rigid, semi-rigid, and fully articulate. Fully who? Fully articulate. Articulated? Articulate, yes. <laughs> Articulated, yeah. Okay. What are some cases? Tell me some, give me some examples when helicopters don't need tail rotors. Uh, helicopters do not need tail rotors in tandem rotor helicopters or coaxial. Is there another one? Another case? And no tar, no tail rotor? No tar, no tail rotor. That was my next question. What does no tar mean? Okay. <laughs> you beat me to it. What is the function? No, that's not what I want to ask. How does the airspeed indicator work? Um, airspeed indicator. So there's true airspeed and actual airspeed. It has nothing to do with how the airspeed indicator works. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. I'm okay. like, uh, I'm going to send you an image. Okay. All right. In this image, and hold on, I'm going to talk to my computer for a second. Airspeed indicator. Okay. Do you ever remember us talking about a pitot static system? Yes. Okay. So the airspeed indicator is the only instrument that is fed by both by the pitot static system, which means you get um, some and you get some readings. Well, not readings. You'll get some. How should I say this? Ram air pressure forced into the pitot tube goes into a a diaphragm mm -hmm. inside the casing and only the, the ram air only goes into this this uh I don't want to say aneroid wafer but it's, it's not like an expandable wafer right okay and then from the static port if you're looking at this image now the static port is connected to the air inside the casing so mm -hmm. just think of like Let's just say, and I'm using this, let's just say this is the face of the airspeed indicator, right? So okay. inside, you're going to have an expandable wafer, right? And the ram air pressure from the pitot tube is just blowing into that wafer. So, boom, it's going to expand and contract. And as a result, it is connected to uh, the needle like a system of linkages and stuff like that or gears all right and it drives so the more speed that you have the more air going into the ram air and the more that 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 uh wafer is going to expand right but it's expanding okay. against the atmospheric pressure inside the case because the atmospheric pressure pressure is fed through the static port okay all right um are there some systems where they kind of prepare for icing? When we talk um, about this pitot static system? 
just de-icing? Nah, pedo heat, not de-icing. Okay. Pedo heat. <coughs> if I'm um, approaching temperatures, and like it's the same thing for aircraft. If I'm approaching mm -hmm. temperatures and notably like IFR conditions, then um, if I'm creeping around, I don't know, 35 degrees Fahrenheit, close to zero degrees Celsius, then I'll turn the pedo heat on. Okay. All right. Um, okay. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right. What are some complications? Because you told me that all the weight in the helicopter or rotary wing aircraft is concentrated at the center of gravity. Mm. Are there any limitations to the center of gravity? Um, yes. Uh, I'm just kind of confused on, so the limitations just structurally or in what way? Could your center of gravity be too far forward, or could it be too far aft? Yeah, to the if rear. You have like heavy pilot, and uh, or uh, if you're full of fuel and a light pilot in the front, yes. Okay, so all right. So what are some some problems I could have? Because in a helicopter, when we land, we kind of tend to want to be nose up, right? Yes. Okay, so if I was nose heavy, could we make that happen? Uh, if your nose heavy, you have to apply more uh, aft cyclic. Okay. Or if you're trying to pick but up. But if speed. the if the center of gravity is too far forward, that might be impossible almost. Maybe I don't. Yeah. And I'm just we're just hypothetically speaking. Uh -huh. All right. Um. What about if it was too far? Center of gravity was too far to the rear. If center of gravity is too far to the rear, it makes acceleration harder. Okay. Uh, yeah, acceleration harder because you can't get the nose down. Exactly. Okay. Let me just give you some notes. All right. mm -hmm. If we're aft of limit, um, a lightweight pilot takes off solo with a full load of fuel located aft of the rotor mass. You know, it could be float back a little bit. Because there's really not enough forward weight ahead of the mass. Because you have a, a, a pilot that's not that heavy. So the load moment... Uh-oh. There's another can of worms. The load moment isn't as strong. What is the load moment? The load moment uh, is the center... The How far the weight is from the center or the fulcrum? Uh, yeah, okay. So the reference datum. The reference uh -huh. datum. Is that f where that fulcrum? Well, hold on. Nah. The fulcrum. I'm thinking first class lever system. Yeah. In this case, first class lever system. Could we call that fulcrum the reference data? I'm going to do some research on that. Okay. Because mentally, I can't really wrap my head around that right now. Okay. Yeah. But. Well, yeah, I can, because, well, no, maybe I can't, because you know what, I'm like thinking, okay, well, you have the reference datum, because the <laughs> reference datum is where everything's measured, pilot from passenger, fuel would have a certain center of gravity, and a baggage area would have a certain, the, the front, pilot from passenger would be a certain distance away, but what I'm <laughs> getting at, what is the load moment? The load moment is a function of distance from the reference datum and weight, right? Yes. And that's why we think about the first class lever systems because uh -huh. you have that fulcrum point where that weight is measured and the load moment is a function of the weight and the distance away. So that's mm -hmm. why we come up with foot pounds or inch pounds in that case yeah. when we're thinking about this stuff mechanically. All right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, now I'm thinking about the fulcrum. Would that be the fulcrum or would the CG be the fulcrum? But, okay, we won't dig that deep. Okay. Um, okay. Load moment was actually the, the, the target that I was uh, going after. Okay. 
what is the relationship between weight and lift in a hover? Is uh, one wait, greater wait. than the other? Are they in equilibrium, balancing each other out, or? They are balancing each other out. Okay, so they're in equilibrium. You're not rising with lift, and mm -hmm. you're not descending with weight. We talked about turns. We talked about if you got your helicopter into a 60 degree bank, mm -hmm. let's say your takeoff weight was 2,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. And I'm just throwing a number out there. If I got myself into a 60 degree bank, how heavy would I be in that 60 degree bank, in the level 60 degree bank? A 60 degree bank is equal to two G's. And what did we say we started out with? So 4,000 pounds. Okay, good. 2,000 go to 4,000. Okay. Would you consider a helicopter at 800 feet above the ground in a hover taxi? No. What about 50 feet? Uh, hover taxi, no. What about 25 feet? 25 feet, yes. All right. Okay. When you are taxiing, how fast do you want to be? Uh, at the pace of a brisk walk. Right. What is the force that makes a helicopter turn? The force that makes the helicopter turn. Mm -hmm. Uh, thrust? Mm-mm. Okay. Um, thrust that makes... I'm not sure. That's not an option, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the horizontal component of lift. The horizontal, okay. I'll go into detail with that. Can you name three legs of a traffic pattern? Yes, um, upwind, downwind, uh, upwind, crosswind, downwind. Upwind, or, crosswind. I didn't downwind. really go in order there. But. No, you didn't have to. I just asked for three. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right. Let me just give you a couple scenarios here. Let's say. You're taking off, right? And your helicopter is on a slope. Okay. So you got a skid down here, a skid down there, and this is a little bit exaggerated. Yeah. Don't laugh at my artwork. <laughs> it's supposed to be parallel with the slope, the main rotor. Mm -hmm. So, okay. you do your pre-takeoff checks and all that and everything, and mm -hmm. are you just going to, like, raise the collective and start no. drifting forward? What are you going to do? You want to raise the downslope skid or wheel up first, and then... So, okay, you want to raise that? Yes. Is that the downwind or the upward? That is down. The downwind skid. Okay. Yeah. So basically, you want to raise this until you're like level level flight. Yeah. Okay, and you're gonna watch your your disc, right? Mm -hmm. Your rotor disc, and make sure there's no obstacles or anything like that. You know, if you come into level flight, it's gonna cone a little bit too, though, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It should cone, you know, slightly when you start generating the lift. Mm -hmm. All right, but it won't be in that static droop, right? Yeah. yeah. And then you take off. All right. Mm. Is there any time when you might need to do a running or rolling takeoff? 
Uh, running cake off if you're uh, if you can't get enough power from a hover to take off. Okay, so the hover is the, is, is the determining factor, right? Yes. But why? What? Why wouldn't we be able to hover? Uh, if the weight is too great, I believe. Mm, that could be a reason. But if the weight is too great, then that means if the weight is too great, then you are departing above your maximum takeoff weight, which is a safety issue. Mm -hmm. It's a weight and balance issue, so you wouldn't yeah. do that either. Uh -huh. So what's what's another factor? Uh, could it be due to wind? No. I'll give you okay. one more shot at um, it. Uh, I know, uh, I'm a pain uh, in the butt, I know. Uh, um, I'm not sure. Could it be due to atmospheric pressure? I'm not too sure. Yeah. Okay. But there's a right, there's a word for that. <laughs> Is it a uh, high density altitude? Yes, the high density altitude, density altitude. And since you opened up that can of worms, what is yeah. density altitude? Density altitude is... I want to hear the textbook. I want to hear the it's definition. Not textbook. Adjusted for... Who, 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 who? Uh, <laughs> atmospheric pressure adjusted for uh, right on the tip. Um, pressure altitude corrected for non standard temperature. Yeah. Pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature. So, depending on some of the charts that you use, the, the you know the performance charts, depending on mm -hmm. uh, temperatures, your temperatures could be a little warm. The atmospheric pressure <coughs> would then be lower mm -hmm. because if we heat up the atmosphere or the the area. Like if a low pressure area maybe came in or whatever, and it was hot, mm -hmm. what what's going to happen to the air density or the atmospheric pressure? It's going to get lighter, or the molecules going to get tighter, closer together. They're going to spread apart. Uh, they're going to go farther apart with, with the heat or okay. humidity, whatever it may be. But it's almost like we're flying at a higher altitude, right? Mm -hmm. And at a higher altitude, as opposed to sea level, are we going to get better performance or worse performance? Worse performance. Worse performance, because those air molecules are going to spread apart. Mm -hmm. All right, your engine is not going to suck in. If it's a turbine engine, it's not going to suck in nice, good density air. Right? Less bite. Less bite from your main rotor, less bite from your, your, your tail rotor. Uh -huh. So you're going to have a lot of factors working against you. And then you don't want to be overweight because then that's a whole other issue. Yeah. All right. So that roll and takeoff is normally, and I'm not, I'm not, I hate saying normally because there are no absolutes. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, you might do it in a wheeled helicopter. Um, you have some density altitude issues where you can't really maintain a sustained hover. So then mm -hmm. you would use that rolling. I mean, as long as you're pro providing your weight's good, because once we get that movement going, we're gonna get. We're probably gonna get some more lift, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Um. effect oh one more thing let's come back we said pressure altitude corrected or not for non-standard temperature yeah how do i figure out what pressure altitude is we're we're in denver colorado we're yeah. a mile above the earth and i want to know the pressure altitude 
Okay. How am I going to figure that out? Um, is it based off of... Uh, 29.2 reading? Who? Spit it out. I'm sorry, it broke Spit up. Spit it out. You said it. You said it. Spit it out. 29.92 HG, uh, 15 degrees Celsius. Okay, now you give me standard. You give me standard. You give me numbers for standard atmosphere. Okay. 29.92 inches of mercury, 15 so, degrees Celsius, 59 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm in my. I'm. You're in your helicopter. Okay. How are you going to find out the pressure altitude? <coughs> um. I'm not. I thought you were going somewhere when you gave me two nine nine two. So did I? Yeah. Then when you gave me the fifteen degrees Celsius, I said, "Oh, you just gave me standard a standard did atmosphere." Did you find the mercury level? All right. In the altimeter. Yes. What's that little window called? Uh, okay, Colesman. A Colesman window. So when we pick up ADIS from an airfield, and it says uh, Olsen Airport, information, mm -hmm. Bravo. Okay. You know, it'll give you your airport conditions. Uh -huh. It'll say altimeter setting, 299 or 2. So the knob on the altimeter, we're going to twist it until we see 29.92 in the Colesman window. Okay. And whatever we, at the point where we set the altimeter to 2992, whatever you see indicated on the altimeter will be your pressure altitude. Okay. All right. So sometimes because it can be a pain in the butt, mm -hmm. you know, when you're a student and you're doing your pre-flight and you're doing a cross country and you got to go out. To, so what I recommend you do is pre-flight the aircraft, get that Colesman window, make sure your aircraft is good, and then come back into once you know, you know, you might listen to ADIS, you might get a weather brief, you'll talk to, you know, a briefer and they'll give you your temperatures and all that and everything. Uh, okay. I wouldn't let them give me a pressure altitude. I would actually turn my altimeter to 292 and see what the indicated pressure altitude is. Because that's the atmosphere pressure in that area. It's not what somebody's just like telling me. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, sometimes, and this is really not SIF related, it's like, like for down the road. As a mm -hmm. pilot, sometimes, like, when I used to fly for the organ donor program, I worked for a company that had a contract with the organ donor program. Mm. Okay, so we're in, I don't know, like, we pick up some organs out of Philadelphia, Northeast Airport, right? Mm -hmm. And we have to fly the organs to Pittsburgh International Airport. And the briefer will be like, oh, man, you know what? There's no weather between you and Pittsburgh. It's <laughs> no <Still> weather, right? <laughs> and you say, okay, because you're going to give the briefer your route of flight, all that and everything, and, you know, whether you're VFR or IFR, which I'm going to ask you about next in a minute. And, mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah, we're going to be IFR. Oh, man, you're going to, you know, look. The cloud tops are at 5,000 feet. So, you know, hey, if you use like 15,000 feet, you're going to be good to go. And there's no weather. And then, you know, when we get over to mountains in Pennsylvania, you know, it's like we're getting hit with all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And you're like, didn't I pray for say? So I like to think of it as you do your own research, get your own weather, call a briefer, Get additional information. The more information you have, the better. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it's just like my little story of um, when they um, just give you airport information or the airport information is normally pretty reliable, but, yeah, whether it's kind of, uh, mm -hmm. okay. 
if you lost your engine yes. in flight, what is the initial? What is what is one of the initial actions? Well, there's something that's going to happen automatically. But mm -hmm. what's going to happen automatically? Uh, the freewheeling unit will disengage. Mm -hmm. All right. And auto rotation, right? Yes. Okay. I didn't talk about ground effect. I said I was going to ask you about IFR and VFR. What is IFR and VFR? IFR is instrument flight rules, and VFR is visual flight rules. Okay. What's the difference? So instruments is flying off of instruments, whereas visual is flying by what you can see okay. out of the aircraft. All right. So we're probably going to be using pilotage. Dead reckoning or radio navigation. Well, radio navigation, you'd be using the IFR flight as well. Mm -hmm. Or GPS satellite. All right. IFR, VFR. Um, hmm. Okay. Just to make your answer more crisp, when you fly IFR, you're flying by reference to instruments. Mm -hmm. You're not flying visually. So you're scanning your, your, your basic instruments and you know, your airspeed, attitude indicator, altimeter, heading indicator, mm -hmm. um, your vertical speed indicator, you, you're scanning those instruments constantly. Where mm -hmm. if you're VFR, I'm looking outside, your head is on a swivel, you're looking out for other aircraft, terrain, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Did you see that Armor 3 video I posted? Uh, I'm not sure, actually. Okay. Um, then you subscribe to me and you just broke my heart. Now I'm playing. I ain't subscribed, but I'm, I'm, I'm just playing. Um, yeah. There's a really good uh, simulator. Um, but just check it out whenever you get the chance. Okay, yeah, I got it right now. Yeah. Ground effect. Ground effect. What is ground effect? Ground effect is... Uh... The Earth's surface, the Earth's surface interference with the airflow around the main rotor. The Earth's surface interference. I like the interference of the Earth's surface mm -hmm. with the airflow patterns about the main rotor around the yes. main rotor. Okay, so would you experience ground effect at like a thousand feet? No. Five hundred feet? No. How about with like within a rotor span of the? Uh... I was just about to say within yeah one rotor okay. span. All right. Okay. So what's the difference? I'm at I'm at a thousand feet, as opposed to, like kind of like coming up on my LZ. And what's the difference? You're talking about this interference with the airflow patterns. What does that mean? What does that mean? So since you're so close to the ground, it, it kind of uh, I know you don't like the word buff, but it kind of like it creates a zone between the buff. No, the cushion is the the cushion is the word I hate. Because everybody's like, oh, no, it's like, it's like a cushion, and, and the aircraft doesn't want to land. I hate that because because uh, my the way I think about aerodynamics and forces. Uh -huh. So, you know, and I'm a nerd, so, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, I always got to be like that guy, you know, like, no, no, it's not a cushion. Uh -huh. What have you lost when you come within that one rotor span of the, you know, what, what have you lost? You've lost something. Altitude? Or, yeah, you've lost altitude. Yeah. <laughs> I love it when you say, yeah, we lost altitude. Yeah, you yeah. lost altitude. Um, That's something to do with the four forces of flight. Uh, you've lost uh, thrust. Uh, no, you haven't. You actually have the same amount of thrust. Okay. Um, uh, 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 I mean, obviously, lift. Uh, I'm not too sure. You've lost. You've lost induced drag. Okay, yeah. Visa, I, okay, that's what I'm saying, yeah. You've lost induced drag. At a thousand feet, your main <laughs> rotor's whirling, 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 whirling around. Mm. So, as that main rotor is whirling, Okay, and I know we we got to think of that as an airfoil, mm -hmm. but to really kind of get your head wrapped around it, 
because sometimes we have a lot of t- times teaching this concept to people, right? They can't really see it in a sense. So we think of it like an airplane, all right? And we look at the wing, and there's a natural camber to this wing. But as this wing flies through the sky towards my head, right, the air molecules are going to have a normal upwash and downwash. Upwash to the, over the leading edge and then a downwash, okay? And I like to say, well, okay, there's a hell of a lot of air molecules down here under this at 1,000 feet. But when we get within one wingspan or that rotor span that we talked about, then what happens is we don't have as much upwash, downwash. So some things are weakened. The difference in airflow over the top and the bottom, low pressure, high pressure area, is why at the tips we get the four vortices. Singular is vortex, plural is four vortices. And what we lose is we lose induced we lose induced drag. Okay. So that's why I'm like the cushion thing. You have the same amount of lift and you have less drag or that negative negative effect going on. All right. And since you lose that component of drag, you know, you get what feels like a cushion. Like in fixed wing airplanes on a really hot humid thing, you know, I would like, you know, you're sitting there and you're watching your student and your student is like, oh my God, you know. Conversely, there's another problem with ground effect. If we come up out of that wingspan or blade span, mm-hmm. boom, that drag comes back. Yeah. You could slam down to the ground if you don't have enough forward speed. So you stay within that. Even when in fixed wing, you know, or in your helicopter, if you take off a little bit earlier than what you're supposed to, stick, to, just level out and stick to the ground a little bit and get some speed going. Mm-hmm. Once you get that recommended speed that your instructor will tell you, you know, um, like, you know, best rate of climb, like in the Cessnas, are like, I think like, I want to say 75 knots. I don't have a POH in front of me and I don't want to just be quoting numbers. But let's just say, okay, best rate of climb in this aircraft is 75 knots. Okay, mm-hmm. then I want to pitch. I want to. I want to. I want to level out. Okay, because if I'm not at 75 knots, and I'm just hypothetically speaking, because you know people watch my videos and they're like, oh, <laughs> you know. So, so okay, so we break ground early. All right, boom, plane bumps up. Right, I'm not. I'm gonna level out. I'm gonna watch my airspeed indicator when I get my indication. Then I'm gonna boom. In a helicopter, I would get my, my my speed that I wanted, stay within that blade span. When I get my recommended speed, boom. Then I'll then I'll apply some more collective and you know and keep and you know act accordingly. Okay. All right. Uh. All right. Let's see. hypoxia hypoxia is lack of pressurized oxygen in the bloodstream wow pressurized oxygen i like that answer (laughs) textbook like you said so why why is that an issue uh because lack of pressurized oxygen in the blood uh it I guess interferes with cognitive ability. Okay. Yeah. Every couple of years, uh, I go to an altitude chamber. Mm-hmm. Because if you take five different pilots and you put them in an altitude chamber or in a in a an environment conducive to becoming hypoxic, you'll mm-hmm. get. 10 different, you take 10 different pilots, you get ten, you could possibly get 10 different actions because we talk about hypoxia, they, okay, we got loss of muscular um, ability, to, you know, you lose your ability to muscular control. Um, you might not, you might, you may not think this clearly. 
I get silly. I laugh. Seriously. Mm. Ever since I was in my 20s, that was like the first time. I was in an altitude chamber. I was just like real silly. Mm -hmm. So if stuff, if I'm at altitude and, and things aren't really, things are funny, I just be like, boom, I'll suck on some oxygen. Mm -hmm. You know, at nighttime, if I'm like above like 20,000 feet or something like that, or, and I'm just talking about the sense of hypoxia. Okay. But what's the takeaway? There was a takeaway. I had something in mind, and I lost it. Old age. Um. So you said lack of pressurized oxygen. I did like that. Okay. So it's sea level. Mm -hmm. And I'm just throwing numbers out. The standard number is about 14.7 pounds per square inch, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say at 20,000 feet, and I'm just throwing a number out seven pounds per square inch okay so when you when your diaphragm opens up all right the atmospheric pressure is not there that density of air is not there so you don't get as much eh, out of the uh so your body and your aircraft <laughs> at high altitudes mm -hmm. are like and eh, this is not a fun place yeah okay so you need pressurized oxygen and, and that's why like in when you travel you know on commercial aircraft that cabin or that pressure capsule because that's what you're in when they seal the door and they start mm -hmm. the pressurization you're in a sealed capsule and actually the engines help with the pressurization process most I won't say all but most because I don't want to quote systems people like look no, no that's not true yeah. you know most systems the aircraft help with the engines or the power plants i should say help with the pressurization okay that was a fun hour and you yeah. know what you're you're i mean you get a couple wrong here and there but your your confidence is definitely there now yeah i mean from day one to now you're just like i remember you used to stumble over everything like uh <laughs> Yeah. And then I like how you give those little quick answers, you know. Yeah, some of them I jump right on top. Yeah, there are a few today mm -hmm. where, yeah, definitely, I kind of, like, know the gist of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, like I said, you're prepared for this test, stay paranoid. Mm -hmm. The worst thing you could do is think this test is just going to be a walk in the park. And, oh, man, oh, you know, hey, man, yeah. I trained with Kino, which is good, you know. You had a good instructor. Yeah. And I pat myself on the back. Yeah, <laughs> but just stay paranoid. Keep reading. Yeah. Keep reading. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, there's more we're gonna talk about down the road. Yeah. But um, you are, you're wired pretty tight, man. I gotta say. Yeah. So, um, any quick questions before we close? I'm good. Uh, I just want to know if we could do the regular Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just wondering if. Tomorrow we could do spend a little bit of time on just some hidden figures, or if you can just send me some. Mm -hmm. Well, we're gonna meet tomorrow. No, what's yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. So, so all right. we're gonna meet tomorrow. So yeah, uh, actually, yeah, I have some some really good uh, hidden figure questions that we're gonna Great. go over. And um, I thought you have some in your timeline. I do have a few, but I've I've gone to the point where I've gone over those. Hey, and you want like up. a you want like a hundred. You want like a hundred, so you can just snap, yeah. choose, snap, choose, snap, choose, snap, choose. So exactly. you can just flow. So yeah, mm -hmm. we'll work on that tomorrow. Yeah, because some of them that I have on the timeline, I've just kind of like I see it and I know where it is just because I've looked at it so many times and it's not that many. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I need to put like a I need to put like a PowerPoint thing together. So where you can shuffle them. Yeah, exactly. Make them like fat flashcards and shuffle them, like a hundred yeah. of them. And mm -hmm. so boom, because that's going to yeah, make it's like a, a generator. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's going to make a big difference. All right. Okay. Before you go. Yes. What is... What is, it, what is an isogonic line? Oof. Yeah, oof. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. 
I'm blanking. Okay. Or I don't even know if I know. Go to skyvector.com. Okay. And that's your <laughs> home, that's that's your homework. Uh, no, I won't make it your homework. I'll just tell you what it is. So isogonic line is depicted on a tactical chart or a sectional chart or well we well what you'll be using in the army is probably a tactical pilotage chart. But if you go to skyvector.com, a lot of the symbols are the same and stuff like that and everything, right? But there's a difference between magnetic north and true north. I was just about to say, yeah. Okay. Um, and as a result, your magnetic compass will never take you to the geographic north pole. Uh -huh. And the thing is, is like when we give issue latitude, longitude, latitude, longitude, go to the geographic North Pole. Your magnetic compass is aligning itself with the magnetic flux lines of the Earth, and um, they are pointing towards the North Pole. You'll have some other issues as you get closer to the North Pole, such as magnetic dip and things of that nature, but, you know, I don't really think, I've never had somebody come back and debrief and come back and say, yeah, man, they were talking about the magnetic compass errors or anything like that. It could be in a pool, like I say, stay paranoid. So, mm. you know, but everything in your uh, U.S. Army field manual mm. and your rotary wing handbook and the field manual, uh, U.S. Army field manual. Yeah. I don't even know if that no. touches on. No, I know you have it. I know you have it, and, yeah. and I have it as well on my end. But yeah, everything in that rotary, everything in that in that in the field manual, and everything in the rotary wing flying handbook, just know mm -hmm. it. You don't get caught with your pants down. And yeah. if you got the field manual down, actually, I just pulled it up. If you have the field manual down, um, field manual for rotary wing flight. And you know what? It was crazy. Um, like, okay, it looks like this thing was published in 1974, right? They have a book that the yeah. United States Navy uh, published called Aerodynamics for Naval Aviators. And that was, like, published, like, in the mm. 60s or 70s, right? Like, this manual is still relevant. You know, yeah. as I read through it, man, this manual is still relevant. So mm. it's like these dudes published this thing, like, decades ago, man. And, I mean... Everything in here is like, it's crazy. Just like that United States Navy aerodynamics for naval aviators, because I work with aviation selection test battery people, the nav, mm -hmm. the pilot nav people. And or, it's just like, dude, you look at the aerodynamics, density, altitude, you know, the pressure ratio, temperature, you know, and you'll, you'll go through all this in aerodynamics, but it's still relevant, dude. It's, it's crazy to me. Mm -hmm. You know. Okay. All right, brother. I'm done with you, man. I'm done beating okay. you up. <laughs> no good though. Yeah, you did a good job. You really did Thank a good you. job. So that's all I have for you, sir. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, so tomorrow at three. Fifteen hundred. Yep. Thank you very much. All right, buddy. Have a good night. Okay. So these are, uh, this was the SIF test. Well, it, we were, we're preparing, I'm preparing a client for the SIF test uh, for United States Army aviators. And um, we know we covered some things. Um, we didn't cover everything. You know, as I mentioned before, everything uh, in your rotary wing handbook or the United States Army uh, field manual for rotary wing flight is, are things that you definitely want to be uh, familiarize with um, just want to make sure I hit all my talking points that I wanted to talk about I never do like I'll look at the video later and be like oh man I forgot to talk about this alright so if you are uh, looking to go into war warrant officer flight training um, make sure you check out my latest video though that Arma, that Arma 3 game it was really, really cool. It was really fun making that video. <laughs> but it was like kind of like a simulator with obstacles and, and landing points and all that and everything. So make sure you guys check that out.
Um, yeah, there we go. All right, so, all right, I just want to kind of look in the comments. <laughs> Viper, it's good to see you. And Viper's like, yes! Uh, AST, I've done a lot of, I've done some aviation selection test battery. Uh, James Falkmer, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. But welcome, thank you for coming in to the live, to the, uh, live stream. Uh, yeah, it's you and Viper. Okay. So, I think somebody else just said something. Alright, Viper just clears GT score requirement now into the SIFT. Yeah. So, and just keep in mind, even if it doesn't have, it doesn't have to be me, find a qualified tutor with a proven record of getting guys through the SIFT test, man, because don't think you're just going to get the books, and you know what I'm saying? Like, I have books on top of books, man, hang on, boom. I get this guy, and you know what? I'm pissed with these guys, except at Inc. I'm pissed with these guys, and I'm going to tell you why. But yeah, I'm having a little bitching session, right? If you look at, if you go on Amazon and you look at this book and it says over 500 practice questions, that's what it says on the book, 500. Then when you get this thing in the mail, it's 300. I, I was a little pissed. So guys that accepted ink, um, that might be something you guys want to look into. You know, especially for guys that, you know, now I do like this book. It's one of the better ones. But you guys could step up game, step your game up on the um, on the aviation side of things. Um, the Army aviation information side side of things. But the mechanical is really really good. The reading comprehension has some really really good stuff in it. But I was a little pissy when I look on Amazon and the image that you guys have is 500 questions and you get this thing in the mail and it's 300 questions. This is a decent book, military flight aptitude test, but here's the thing. All the math is beneficial. This has the SIF test, the AFOQT, and the United States Navy Marine Corps Aviation Selection Test Battery. But just because it's AFOQT math, if, like if you're taking the ASTB and it's like, oh, that's the SIF math section or the AFOQT math section, all the math as much math as you can get your your hands on. You want to get as much your hands on, and I hope I'm saying it right. You want to get your hands on as much math as possible. Um, and um, yeah, because you don't know what they're going to drop in your lap. You have no idea mathematically or mechanically what they're going to drop in your lap. And that's why when I train guys, we cover such a broad swath of. Algebra 1, a little bit of Algebra 2, Geometry, a little bit of Trig, um, but, it, but mostly Algebra, because that's what a lot of people have a problem with, and word problems, word problems, word problems. Word problems are, and my, I've been preparing people for the SIFT before it was the SIFT, before the, it was the SIFT, it was the AFAST, or, you know, recruiters, oh, that's the FAST test, but... I think it's A-Fast, but however, whatever, fast, A-Fast, doesn't matter, it's the SIFT now. But I've been preparing guys back then, um, since then, you know, and that is a real barrier for a lot of people, word problems. If you can't look at the words and turn it into math on paper, that's going to be an issue for you. Um, so... That's all I have in my little rant there about that book, Accept the Ink. Please do something about this or contact Amazon because a lot of people are going to be pissed if the, the image is telling people that they're going to get over 500 test questions or over 500 practice questions. And then, you know, you get a book and there's only three. Um, you know, I'm not, you know... Um, crapping on the book because there is good information in it but at the same time when people don't get what they pay for it's kind of like or what they're expecting that, that's a customer service thing so 
Yeah, Arma 3 is on Steam. And I don't know if you guys have seen the uh, the video I did, but if you can go to my video listings, you can see it. Where I actually had, you know, to actually use a collective, a cyclic, and anti-torque pedals and stuff. And I had to maneuver. Now, here's the thing. If you get the game, um, it's not just that. It's also like a first-person shooter. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get my set guys coordinated with another set of guys that are um, in the first-person shooters and like like the Call of Duty games and stuff like that. And there's like maps and navigation uh, principles that you can apply. And you actually have to... Uh, I'm trying to pull up an image. Give me a sec here. You'll actually have to... Uh, the first person shooters could actually get in your helicopter and then you can transport them to a point. So, you know, it'll just give you a little bit about... And then there's night, night vision and stuff like that and everything. So I just really thought it was a really cool game. But before you get into the game, because your first person shooters are going to be pissed if you can't. That's what I'm saying. They have a virtual training thing in, on this game. Um, and that's why I say take the virtual training. You got advanced basic maneuvers and things of that nature and stuff. Because if you link up with your first person shooters and you're crashing the helicopter all the time, that's not going to be fun. So go through the virtual training where you can land, you know, in, you know, obstacles and stuff like that and keep in, in mind that you could be shot at and stuff like that. And, you might have to fly what we call nap of the nap of the earth flying, where you're kind of flying at treetop level and stuff like that. So, um, I just thought it was a really cool game. And mentally, my mind is always, well, what, what could you do with this? You know, training wise, give these guys an idea. Um, you know, so yeah, that's it. But I have to prepare for a group uh, that. Uh, I'm working with. I have to prepare uh, for them. I got a little SIFT conference going on with them. And these are uh, all my people working on math and mechanical comprehension questions. But I appreciate you guys checking my video out. Um, I'm just trying to make sure. Um, but you can actually see the image if you check that video out. But Arma 3 is on Steam. Uh, the Steam platform. And um, yeah, the Arma 3 is pretty good. Now you got it, and, and then here's a disclaimer, well not a disclaimer, but there's some extra stuff you need, okay, because you can't just fly the sim two-dimensionally, you need like head tracking software, like I have this, and I have a camera that picks up these little LEDs, right, and then as I turn my head, I don't have to go on my keyboard and hit a directional control. So, like, if I'm landing in a helicopter and there's an obstacle here to my left, I can just look left and boom, I can see the op obstacle. You know what I'm saying? I could, you know, use Oculus Rift. Here's my Oculus Rift. You, I, use, I use them both. But sometimes I go with Oculus Rift on games where there's not, but that's not going to be an issue. You can use just, this is a cheaper option. Um, and I think it's a little bit, better because you can see the keyboard and all that. With the Oculus Rift, you can't see your keyboard. Now, they have this little touch thing going on as they're developing, but and I'm not saying it's be it's better. The Oculus Rift is actually way better because it's like actually like um, you're sitting in a helicopter and I was letting my cousin play with it one time and I said, listen, if you crash, close your just close your eyes, dude, because the sensory perception is, is crazy. Like, if you have a mishap, like, if you stall in the plane, it's just like, boom, you get the break and all that and everything. So, it's pretty cool. I'm running my mouth too much. But, um, I'm going to do more. I'm going to do more things. This year is the year where I do more. I'm concentrating more on my SIFT people because I, I don't really, I know I don't do enough for you guys. And that's basically because you guys were kind of like the last not saying that you are the last, but you guys were kind of the last thing I ever concentrated on. Um, I mean, I helped guys out with, with the aviation, with the Army aviation information and whatever they needed to do math mechanically. 
but I need to produce uh, more videos when it comes to um, you guys. And that is really like a, um, a, a focal point of, of my year in 2020, because I need to do more. I mean, like the Navy OAR guys, the Navy ASTB guys, I've been doing, that's been really like my main focus. I really don't run into a whole hell of a lot of people with the AFOQT. Over the years, you know, I just know what they need to focus on and stuff like that. But yeah, my US Army and WAFT guys, which if you guys don't know, warrant officer flight training guys, um, I am definitely gonna focus and do more videos for you guys because um, I just want, I want everything to be fair and balanced. I don't wanna make sure that everybody's getting what they need and stuff, but that's all I have. I'm Kino with STEM with Kino.com, and I appreciate you guys watching. Uh, please like the video, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye bye.